It is that time of the week when we try to inform you and entertain you by talking to interesting people. That's the goal each and every week on Our Town here on 94.9 and 99.1 The River. My name is Darren Swenson. Our Town, as always, brought to you by Decora Bank and Trust. We've got four guests on the program this weekend. We'll talk about a couple of events uh, coming up this weekend. Michaela Collins will join us uh, for the Northeast Iowa Walk for Alzheimer's. That's taking place this Saturday in Decora. Also uh, coming up this weekend will be the 100th anniversary of the Inwood Ballroom in Spillville. We'll discuss uh, those festivities with Wanda Cole from the Inwood Ballroom. But we're going to have a couple of uh, conversations with superintendents uh, beforehand. We'll talk to Decorah School Superintendent Mark Lane. He'll talk about uh, what the district has uh, investigated regarding the uh, incident that took place on the first day of school and also, uh, the fact that uh, a federal judge has uh, thrown out the state law that banned mask mandates in the state of Iowa. We'll talk about that with uh, Mark Lane, but news was made in the South Winnesheek School District this week. The uh, South Winnesheek School District uh, voters will be voting on a bond issue for a new high school in November. And we'll have that conversation right now with Superintendent Chris Ike. We'll do that. As we start our town, brought to you by Decora Bank and Trust on 94.9 and 99.1 The River. News was made this week. The South Winnesheek School Board approved an election for November 2nd for a new high school and a bond issue in that district. And here to discuss that issue is South Winnesheek Superintendent Chris Ike. And Chris, uh, let's start it with the this uh, point. uh, How did we get to this point from the original facilities idea that uh, you community members and the board had to this point? Take us through that process. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Darren. So South Winnesheek and NICC have had a a strong partnership and and collaboration for many years. Uh, However, we wanted to enhance and strengthen the partnership and collaboration to provide students more opportunities. So back in December of of 2016, South Winnesheek and NICC began having regular discussions about our vision, how we could make it a reality. Uh, We've been very deliberate, methodical, and strategic with the process to make sure we're doing everything we can to benefit everyone, specifically our students. Because that's, at the end of the day, that's that's what we want to do. We want to provide as many opportunities for our students as we possibly can. And... Is that the main reason why the proposed location would be on the NICC campus as compared to another location or remodeling your current building? Yeah, absolutely. The current, you know, our current building uh, has been very well maintained, uh, maintained, but it's, it's just an aging structure. You know, the original building was constructed in the, in the 1930s. And then there was an addition in the 1960s and another addition in the early nineties and it's really just not designed for safety protocols or for expansion. So, you know, we felt it would be better for students to, de- for students, uh, we felt it would be better to design a new building to provide 21st century learning environments that are flexible to support future technology and teaching methods. So, you know, the new facility provide better entry and exit points, uh, have more efficient use of space and parking, There'll be a large commons area, which will serve as a lunchroom and make it possible to have one lunch period instead of the current three lunch shifts. This will provide students with more flexibility with their schedules as well as travel time. And then of course, the proximity to NICC will allow for the sharing between the school and college to grow and be more efficient. So that means students can take courses on the campus as well as in the high school, which is already happening, but will be much more manageable because of less travel time needed. Also, we share staff. So Darren, for example, our chemistry teacher teaches two college level chemistry courses on the NICC campus, as well as teaching science science courses in in the Southwind School. We want to enhance those sharing opportunities because it makes both NICC and Southwind more efficient by utilizing those shared resources and providing students more opportunities. And then the last really key component is we want to create a regional center with neighboring school districts that will enhance our career academies. And again, again, it sounds, I sound like a broken record, provide more opportunities for students. 
And if this measure is approved, where specifically on the NICC campus would the high school building be located? Yep, it'll be located between the softball field and the child care center. Simple enough. Uh, the measure that went before the board allows you uh, to uh, bond up to $19,155,000. Will all of that money be put towards a new high school or will the, or there be uh, other facility uh, projects throughout the district that will be a part of that bond issue? Yeah, so, so this will be used to provide funds to build, furnish, and equip a new high school building and improve the site, okay? Now, we will use our Pebble and save funds for improvements to the elementary middle school in Oshin, which would include an update to the HVAC system, and to, we would like to put a fitness center on the gym in Oshin. And is that part of the reason uh, the financing uh, for the new high school will be due to uh, or exclusively through general obligation bonds? I know some other districts in uh, years past have uh, partially funded it through PEPL dollars and through uh, yep. lost uh, dollars as well. Uh, is that part of the reason uh, you want to separate those funds? Yes, absolutely. Um, we looked at two different options, and one of those options was actually using Pebble and Safe Funds, but we don't want to strap ourselves, Darren. In other words, we still have to be able to fix a roof and buy a bus and uh, you know purchase new computers. We have reoccurring costs every year, so we have to make sure that we don't become cash poor and that we can still do those things and maintain our current facilities. As for the vote itself, is this a measure that will need a supermajority to pass? Yep. The, yes, the, the bond election for school buildings and our sites must be approved at at least 60% of those voting. If the measure gets approved, what will happen to the current high school building? Yep. This is equally as important is that we have a plan for the existing building. We do not want it to become dilapidated. In fact, we would like to use the gym and auditorium. So we are currently working to partner with public and private entities to determine usage of the facility. And if uh, this uh, measure is approved, uh, everyone wants to look at their uh, bottom line. Let's say you got a $100,000 property in the, the South Winnesheek School District. How much would taxes go up should this measure get approved? Great question. So a residential property with a $100,000 valuation will have their taxes increased by $10.68 per month, or if you want to break it down more, $2.50 per week or 36 cents a day. So essentially what that means is the tax increase per month equates to the cost of two Happy Meals at McDonald's or half of a Mabe's pizza. And you look at uh, the financing of this and uh, the population of the district. And I know, and you very well know, population trends of rural Iowa school districts uh, really haven't been moving in the right direction uh, for a while. What are the trends that you're seeing in the South Winnesheek district? And how does that conversation and the conversation about the future of facilities, how are they intertwined? Yeah, you know, most school districts in the state of Iowa have been experiencing declining enrollment for quite a few years now, and, and South Wind's no different. Uh, in my seven years at South Wind, our enrollment has went down. However, we are stabilizing and looking to stay pretty even for the foreseeable future. And do you believe that uh, if there is an improvement regarding facilities, you can stabilize that enrollment even more, uh, knowing the fact that the technology yep. and a uh, little bit more opportunities and the closeness to uh, NICC will be more attractive to your district as compared to somebody looking uh, for other educational options? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's really what we're hoping that this will do. Absolutely. And if folks want to find out more about the specifics of the district plan, uh, how do they do that? Uh, are you going to have some public opportunities for them to do so? Yeah, we'll be holding our first open forum on Wednesday, September 29th at 7 p.m. in the high school auditorium, okay? And then after that, we'll be going out to each of our communities and holding more open forums to answer questions. And then we'll also be posting information on our website very soon. 
All right, uh, Chris, anything else uh, are, we're missing? Anything else uh, the public needs to know about this upcoming vote at this time? You know, I just want to leave kind of this message with everyone that, you know, what we want to do is what's best for students. That's something since I've come to Southwind and I've stressed to the school board and my staff. And again, uh, they probably get tired of me saying this all the time. But if we do what's best for students and we keep that as our number one objective, we're going to be just fine. Chris, we appreciate you taking some time telling us about the upcoming uh, bond issue vote in uh, the Southwind uh, School District. Uh, Always informative and uh, always uh, important information to pass on to the public. And we appreciate you taking some time this afternoon to uh, pass it on to our listening audience. Thank you, Darren, for having me. Appreciate it. Chris Eink is the superintendent of the Southwind School District. They will be going to the polls for a bond issue for a new high school on November 2nd. Time now for our monthly conversation with Decorah School Superintendent Mark Lane, our first official conversation of the new school year, as we uh, chatted last month, a little before school began. And Mark, we'll start our conversation, uh, and this was a topic of discussion on Monday night at the school board meeting, uh, the events of August 23rd, when a student uh, got away from the uh, building. Uh, Fortunately, uh, there was a happy ending to that story, because let's face it, a lot of those stories don't have happy endings. Uh, I know uh, you've looked into uh, what went on that day. Uh, What can you pass on to the public about uh, what the district uh, has investigated about that day and uh, your best efforts to make sure uh, you're not in that situation again? Yeah, you know, I think um, we spent time... um, just conducting an investigation, two big components of that investigation were reviewing our, our security camera system footage um, that was available. We have we have security cameras throughout the district and using our camera system at the high school campus and then at John Klein campus um, and just reviewing as much of that as we could to try and, and build a, a complete picture of uh, really the events um, that, that occurred that day with the, the student leaving the high school campus and then um, collecting just recollections and observations from our our employees um, that that were in proximity or were involved that day. And as I shared um, last night with our school board, as as we've really tried to build out a complete picture of, I guess I would say, um, the first hour and a half um, to two hours of of that event that that happened um, in our building after arrival time for all students that morning uh, through what was, uh, you know, when we, um, expanded that search beyond um, the the campus's area. And, and uh, you know, I think really two big things stood out for us, um, you know, and, and one was just that, 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 uh, that human error that, you know, unfortunately can happen from time to time when we're implementing our, our plans. We, we had mistakes that, that occurred in that day and in that time. Um, but then there's also just the element of random chance. And the example I shared with the board last night was, um, you know, when when the uh, situation where the student wasn't where they were supposed to be was discovered and start and the the um, the search for location or identifying and finding where the location of the student was, um, right? There were opportunities as we reviewed camera footage where if if uh, somebody would have made a decision to go out a door uh, 50 to 75 feet down the hallway from the door they made a choice to go outside through, um, it's very likely that they would have seen um, uh, where the student was, um, but that just wasn't what happened in that, in that. And it wasn't a mistake, it wasn't a bad choice, it was just there were two doors, the, an adult went out one door to look, um, if they would have gone out a door 75 feet down the hallway, it's very likely that an observation of where the student was would have been made very quickly. Um, And and that's what I think contributed to um, the events of that day. You know, things we've done to ensure um, that that things like that don't happen again. One is addressing within um, an individual education plan, a plan specifically for for a student, and I've encouraged all families that have reached out to me. Um, you know, we we have almost 130 students in our district uh, that have an, an uh, individual education plan. And, and there are plans um, designed specifically for a number of students in our district. And if parents have, um, if, they, if they saw the events of that day and they say, gosh, that could happen with my child, 
Um, I've, I've encouraged them to reach out to set an IEP meeting so that we can address those uh, unique plans in that individual education plan. Um, we've also talked with our staff and with our students um, about the idea of if you see something, say something, right? We, we, um, we live inside our school buildings, our staff and our, our students, and this just becomes, um, you know, we, we don't necessarily all, always pay attention to what's going on around us. And when we see something that seems out of the ordinary, when we see somebody, um, a person that seems out of place, or, uh, or a situation that seems like it's not a, a, a normal situation, um, whether we're a student, whether we're a staff member, notifying or letting a principal know, letting people um, in the office know. You know we'd much rather uh, address a situation right away um, and find out that it's nothing than to find out something occurred a half hour later and have it be um, a much more significant problem. Um, and, and having conversations too, uh, and, and we do this every year, this isn't a new conversation, but, but this is just a conversation that I think all schools have now in, in the times that we're in. Um, our, our buildings uh, during the school day, we, we expect people to go through the main front door, uh, to check in, to, to go through the office. Um, and, and if a student or an employee, if we're walking by a side door of one of our schools, um, and we see somebody standing outside the door, um, it may seem rude, um, but we can't just open doors and just let people come in. Um, we, you know, and, and that can be hard for a nine-year-old uh, to see an adult standing outside a door and just to ignore them and pretend like they don't see them. Um, and so you have to have those teaching conversations and, and, and talk about, you know, we, we expect people to go through the front door to check in in the office uh, and, and so, you know, working with our staff, with our students, those are those conversations that are having globally and, and in the big picture. Um, and then outside of our school, I think, you know, we have always um, we've always had different drills uh, and and uh, and opportunities um, to talk through situations like this with law enforcement and with uh, fire, the fire department, with first responders. Um, but, you know even when you drill and when you practice things, they never happen quite exactly how you think they're going to in the drill. And so for our police department, for our first responders, you know, this was a, we have to reflect and we have to look and say, well, what did we do well? Um, where, where would we do things differently? Um, and, and what can we learn so that um, if it's a different situation or something else happens in, in our community uh, that, that we can learn from this situation? Based on your response to my initial question, and I've gotten to know you well enough to know you're not an excuse maker, but did the chaos of the first day of school contribute to this situation? Um, I think it did. I mean, I, I think the first day of school is always a unique day. It's an exciting day. It's a busy day, um, right? Uh, students, um, students are learning new routines. We have new staff. We have returning staff um, and, and everything is right. You, we build plans, we build routines, we build uh, our, our expectations, but then 1,650 students show up um, and, and they, they come on ma en masse to the school. Um, but, but it, like I said, that's, that's not an excuse. Um, it, but, you know, I think the fact that it was the first day um, probably contributed to just a little bit of the, the confusion and added to the likelihood that, um, you know, some, some errors were made and, and, uh, and things um, went the way they did. Um, I, I think our response, um, identifying that a student was missing in a timely fashion, taking the necessary steps to communicate within the building and getting multiple people um, out quickly and looking for uh, and, and trying to rectify the situation. That happened very quickly and followed the processes we have in place. Our communication with local law enforcement, um, you know, unfortunately uh, we were in the situation, but the protocols and the things that we have said we would do when these kinds of things occur, those actions were taken in a timely way. Um, and, and then it's an opportunity just to reflect back and say, 
yep, did it work the right way it was supposed to? Did that communication with law enforcement? Did our, um, you know, our our central command once uh, we set up at city hall with law enforcement? What would we do differently in that situation? Um, and 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 so talking with Winnesheet County Emergency Management, with Chief Smutzler, um, you know, those have been ongoing conversations and opportunities for us to learn together. And ultimately, as we touched on, uh, it was a happy ending because the young man was returned to his family. But in addition to that, when you see a quarter to a third of the community show up and help search for this young man and uh, mm -hmm. everybody being involved in that and it being a top concern for pretty much all members of the community, how did that make you feel? It was overwhelming. I mean, it was, you know, it was... Um you uh you're incredibly thankful and grateful um and you know i think it, it showed me you know it showed me that human capacity for empathy um for people to put themselves in the shoes uh of of a family um that that's in just a terrible uh position of of wondering where their child is and, and that was what i really saw that day um, is is just a, a deep sense of empathy that drew people out to try and be a part of helping. Um, and I think that was part of, of what was overwhelming that day too, was then um, trying to effectively manage that many people and get them out there doing something, right? We had, we had, uh, uh, we had a plan for canvassing and really documenting how we how the search was going, and and that was coordinated by the the task force group that had come from Cedar Rapids, and and they were just meticulous in where they were sending people, getting reports back about what was observed, and so it was just amazing to watch um, just the coordination that went into that search. And I know, I know some people expressed you know that they were frustrated that they had to wait to get sent out. Um, but I think it, ultimately the coordination was really critical uh, so that we weren't just haphazardly, you know, searching the same area twice, but leaving one area with no search happening at all. And, and so um, just that planful approach uh, was, was amazing to watch and be a part of. And then the response um, was, was overwhelming to just feel um, that connection and that care and empathy from people. Moving from a difficult subject to a controversial subject, uh, news came out on Monday that the uh, state legislature's law that they passed in May, the uh, ban on a school district's right to uh, enact a mask mandate was, uh, was uh, lifted by a federal uh, judge. The federal judge said mm -hmm. the uh, law wasn't uh, constitutional and uh, di did not uh, protect uh, students' uh, Health moving forward. What does a district do in this uh, situation? Does that give you an option? Should situations uh, warrant it if uh, the COVID numbers increase? Is this something that uh, you're discussing already? Where is the district at? Knowing the fact that the legal challenge to this has uh, overturned that law, at least for the moment. Um, I guess the you know the first thing we're doing is taking the time to digest the judge's complete order. So, you know, the, it's, it's easy to just read the headline in the paper and see, well, the judge, you know, the judge ruled that uh, the mask ban law is unconstitutional. Um, the judge issued a 30 page uh, written summary of his, uh, of his uh, ruling. And so digesting that I think is step one for, for us as a school district. Um, we had, I had an opportunity yesterday to spend about 20 minutes um, in a Zoom call with uh, representatives from the other school districts that are named in the lawsuit. Um, and then with, uh, with uh, legal counsel uh, that's representing uh, nine of those school districts. And, and that occurred about an hour after our attorney had received the judge's ruling. And so it was really just an initial walk through. Um, here's here's our, our attorney's initial interpretation of the judge's order um, and what it means. 
Um, and and um, we continue, I plan and uh, have a plan here this afternoon to continue that conversation um, with, with our legal counsel. Um, I, I think one of the things I hope that people would recognize um, in, in the last two years is as a board, um, I don't think we ever rush into making rash decisions. Um, you know, we know that the action we take at the board table impacts uh, our entire community, right? A decision we make has ripples that go out and affect thousands of kids, hundreds of employees and families and people in our community. And, and we, take that, we take that really seriously. And so our board will be deliberate in um, understanding the judge's interpretation, um, in understanding the authority that has been granted back to the board uh, and what that means for the board um, in gathering feedback and input um, from our stakeholders and then ultimately uh, making a decision. Um, I would hope that over the next few days, uh, we can be clear about our plan um, for when the board would meet uh, to discuss um, the, 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 the decision and uh, what we might either not do or do in light of the judge's decision. Um, but it, today, I guess I would say, is a day of learning from our attorney, of a, um, a day of thinking about what are the steps, what are the things we need to do um, to work in a transparent way with the community and with our school district. So from a procedural standpoint, this would be a decision, should you reenact a mask mandate, it would be a decision that would lie solely with the board instead of maybe you or the administrative team, is it a board decision or is it a collaborative decision? But um, who ultimately has that responsibility? So the way we have, the way we have uh, done our return to learn and, and COVID pandemic related work, um, this would ultimately be uh, a decision that's made at the board table and an approval of what I would see as a change to our return to learn plan. So a year ago at this time, our return to learn plan included a mask mandate. It was, it was one component of our return to learn plan. And that return to learn plan was implemented throughout the school year. Um, and then on May 20th, when the ruling happened, a component of that return to learn plan was no longer within our board's control. And so the opportunity to make a decision about masking was an individual decision. With the judge's decision now, um, the judge is indicating that, that that's a local decision. Um, we would at the board table take up our return to learn plan. We, we last approved our re return to learn plan at our August meeting. And in our return to learn plan, we encouraged people to follow the CDC recommendation about masks. So right now what is board approved is an encouragement of following the CDC guidance that everybody wear a mask in the K-12 setting. So should the board, um, should that change, it would, it would require board action. So yesterday um, there was a news, a press release from Des Moines Public Schools where the superintendent of Des Moines Public Schools indicated that he was reinstating their mask mandate and it would start tomorrow on Wednesday. Um, well, in the work that they have done as a board, they've established that that's an administrative decision. And so Dr. Ahart, he, he could take that action without a board meeting. Um, that's not how we have operated in the pandemic. We have, we have gone about that approval process as a board policy uh, decision rather than just an administrative decision. And maybe this is a little bit uh, unfair of a question because you're still learning and trying to figure out what those uh, legal 30 legal pages of documents uh, truly say, but mm -hmm. what would be the reason to steer in one way or the other regarding the potential uh, recommendations uh, moving forward regarding masking? Um, well, I guess for me personally, and, and what uh, when I would talk with our board, um, I would look at, well, 
what does the CDC recommend for schools? Um, what does the American Academy of Pediatricians recommend for schools? Um, in this case, I think we have to we have to have the conversation around what do our, what does our legal representation um, recommend to us? Um, when you look at when you look at uh, the judge's order, um, and, and he talks about uh, right the constitutionality of the Iowa law. Um, that now right that was. Uh, he points to uh, legal precedents in his writing, um, but we are we are in uncharted territory here. Um, and so, uh, a part of what our a part of what any school district uh, right before you know just before I got on with you, I just up, hung up the phone with a superintendent from one of the ten districts involved in in this suit, along with us, um, and and just talking through what are you going to do. Um, what are you thinking about? What are the steps that you're going to take? And so uh, I, I know that uh, those wheels turn slowly sometimes to the, the public, um, but that's intentional. That is an opportunity um, to think about what are, what are the consequences, intended and un unintended consequences of following this path? What are the consequences that are intended or unintended of following this path? Um, you know, uh, it, it's on a much smaller scale, but it's not dissimilar from when I'm out in my car at 4.30 in the morning trying to, to decide whether or not to cancel school because of weather, right? No matter what I decide, somebody's going to disagree with me. Um, there, there's just, there's, there's, uh, there's no formula for just saying, yep, we should have school, no, we shouldn't. It's a judgment call. And, and we take in that information and, and so, um, there are passionate, passionate feelings on both sides of the mask issue. Um, you take in information and you filter that through uh, our mission and our vision and our values as a district. And you say, what do we think is in the best long-term interest of our students and of our district to make that decision? So far, it looks like from a numbers perspective, the COVID numbers in the early going of this season uh, or this academic year for uh, your district are definitely looking okay to this point. Is that fair to say? Um, I think you have mixed. I think you have mixed results. Okay. Um, that concern that you know that make me feel uneasy about um, what's what we know. Um, last last week on Thursday, um, we had we had no students uh, or staff, zero people that were missing school in isolation due to a positive test. Um, the night before, on Wednesday evening last week, uh, the Iowa Department of Health they published their new results, and for Winnesheet County, they were showing that 39 percent of the positive cases in our county. Um, were in the age group of, of children between zero and 17 years old. Um, and so uh, I think it's difficult. Uh, I think it's difficult for us to know right now um, the extent to which uh, positive cases are impacting our school and our county. I'm, I'm, I'm happy um, that our incidence of positive tests uh, so far this year have been low and that we were at zero on Thursday last week. Um, when I talk with, with uh, Krista Vandenbrink, the director of Winnesheet County Public Health, to learn more about um, you know, the options for testing in our community and the timeliness of how that information flows from Test Iowa um, into the systems of Iowa Department of Public Health, um, you know, just the amount of time between when a test is taken and when a person knows their positive result. Um, I wish we had that information in a more timely fashion. 
but yeah, I, I think uh, right now um, I feel good about uh, where we're at um, with keeping students in school um, and, and And you mentioned the numbers, the Iowa Department of Public Health and numbers and your district numbers. Obviously, Iowa Department of Public Health uh, comes up with their own numbers. Do you get your numbers from the district? Are they reported through your school nurse or through administration? How does that work out? How, how does your district uh, compile its COVID-19 numbers? Our numbers are what's communicated to our school nurses. Um, and so, you know, we are, our, our school nurses are those healthcare professionals that are employees in our district. Um, I, I think they're the right people for that information to be filtered through. Um, and, and so we, we encourage people, um, we encourage people to have that, com that, that communication with our nurses. Um, if they have questions about symptoms that their children are experiencing, if they have a positive case in their home and their, their child is not experiencing symptoms, we encourage them to call um, just to get you know, some, some guidance and some feedback. Uh, and so our data um, is what's collected uh, through our nurses. Um, and right now, just as a um, sort of a check-in each week, what we're, what we're sharing out with the community is uh, on every Thursday, um, how many positive, uh, active positive cases are we experiencing? So on that Thursday of the week, how many staff and or students are in isolation, not at school or at work um, due to a positive COVID test? And related to potential close contacts, let's say a family member has a, a positive case, uh, potentially close contacts in quarantine and isolation with those folks. Are you treating the vaccinated folks differently than the unvaccinated as a district policy right now? Um, you know, we, we are, uh, we cannot force quarantine. Um, that's different than last year. Um, we're, we're, uh, you know, we're able to ask um, about vaccination status, but people don't have to tell us. Um, and so I guess I would say we are, uh, we are providing um, guidance that is aligned to uh, CDC and Iowa Department of Public Health um, guidelines related to isolation or quarantining. Um, but ultimately, uh, some of those decisions are ultimately left in at home and, and up to a family um, to make. It's, it's different than last year where there was a high level at the state, local and school level, there was a coordinated effort of contact tracing um, and, and uh, Winnesheet County Public Health or the Iowa Department of Public Health, they may have required quarantining in certain cases and we may have been a part of that communication chain. Um, in in uh, late May, a directive came out from the I Iowa Department of Public Health that they were no longer going to conduct that contact tracing. Um, and so uh, it, it really has been more just of providing, um, providing guidance and then leaving that decision ultimately, in the case of quarantining, up to others. Um, that isolation with a known positive um, is a, is more of a required step, um, but but the quarantining is is more of a just a guidance and and allowing people to make that decision. Now we've covered some uh, heavy stuff uh, during our conversation uh, here uh, this afternoon. Uh, Mark, anything else you want to pass on to uh, the community at this time? Um, next week is homecoming week, uh, so um, you know lots of lots of. Uh, great happenings and great experiences that are tied uh, to homecoming week. Um, and so it would encourage people uh, to get involved and, and, and be a part of um, just the festivities that, that occur uh, around, uh, around our homecoming. And, and we know we have great, great supporters of our student activities and, and uh, know that, that that is a big part of um, what makes our, our, our uh, experiences for students memories that they, we'll hold on to for a long time. So enjoy homecoming week next week. 
All right, Mark, we appreciate uh, the uh, time and the information as always. Look forward to our conversation next month. Thanks, Aaron. Decora School Superintendent Mark Lane. This weekend, uh, we will be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Inwood Ballroom in Spillville, uh, often referred to as the historic Inwood Ballroom. And it's turning uh, 100 years old this weekend. And here to tell us about the events, uh, Wanda Cole from the Inwood. And uh, Wanda, I guess uh, it turned 100 last year, but uh, COVID kind of got in the way of your fun. But uh, this uh, party will be well worth the wait coming up this weekend, I'd imagine. Yes, it will be. And tell us uh, what's uh, going on. Uh, three days of events. Uh, you get things going on Friday. Uh, what's happening on Friday? Well, Friday starts out with uh, a dinner theater. Uh, it's put on by the Country Road Players, and they're going to be doing a, an entertaining history of the Inwood Ballroom and the Civic Improvement Association. Uh, I'm looking forward to that myself, but we will, uh, as part as the dinner part, we will be having a rack of pork dinner from U2 uh, catering out of Kelmer, and it'll be a full course meal with all the trimmings, and the tickets are $20 per meal, and that includes the entertainment, of course, and those tickets are for sale in Spillville at Citizen Savings Bank and the Farsight. And then... Um, at nine o'clock on Friday night, we'll have the Avery Gross Band performing. And I wanna take this opportunity to mention that all the music events throughout the weekend, um, free admission. Um, we will accept free will donations, of course, and those free will donations will go towards uh, the dance floor, um, repairing it or replacing it or whatever. So that's where all the free will donations will go for. All right, let's move ahead till uh, Saturday, a, a full day of activities uh, taking place as part of the 100th anniversary. Uh, what's on the docket for Saturday? Well, uh, things start out at two o'clock. Uh, we're gonna have a bootlegger buckets and bottles at the cottage on the uh, Riverside Park grounds. Um, we'll be having homemade uh, wine and beer tasting, uh, various uh, locals, will be providing wine for tasting and Pivo Brewery in Kelmer has done a, uh, a beer for us. I believe it's called Spillville Bootlegger and apparently it is cured in wooden barrels. So that should be a treat for people who enjoy the, the beer, the craft beer and the homemade wine. Um, also during that same time period from two to six, there's going to be a scavenger hunt. Um, it's kind of a family-friendly activity, but along with the scavenger hunt, there will be other various activities, you know, outside for uh, people of all ages to enjoy. Um, and then at 4.30, on the Ludwig stage, the newly built Ludwig stage outside, the Country Road players will again do their um, play of the history of the Inwood and the Civic Improvement Association. And then we get some live music again. The troubleshooter will take the stage at seven o'clock inside the Inwood. Um, the main event is the suite, which is at 10 o'clock. But before we get to that, between the two bands, we're going to send up 101 Chinese lanterns. Now, Chinese lanterns symbolize memory. And we've had 101 years of the Inwood ballroom being in Spillville. So uh, people who would like to participate in this Chinese Lantern Relief, be there at the Inwood. Um, I believe we're just going to have you sign up and we're going to send up 50 lanterns. Then we'll send up another 50 lanterns. And the final lantern will be set up by the members of the board of the Civic Improvement Association. So uh, be there for that. But again, the main event is 10 o'clock sweet takes the stage. And I think everybody's familiar with some of their hits. You know them, Goob, don't you? I believe so, yep. <laughs> uh, and yeah. It, it's, uh, it sounds like a great event. The uh, Chinese Lantern um, memory a thing you're doing, that sounds like an incredibly neat idea. How did you uh, guys come up with uh, such an idea to uh, celebrate this occasion? Well, Stubble is known for fireworks. Uh, this was... Um, 
a different take on, you know, a show in the sky and uh, uh, just something different and something that's symbolic. So, uh, and, and it will involve anybody that wants to be involved. I mean, it can involve, you know, a hundred people. So um, if you, if you want to be part of that, um, I think it'll be really cool. And it's supposed to be great weather this weekend. Uh, should be a beautiful night. I, it's, I think it'll be wonderful. It should be a, a cool event. And uh, of course the uh, weekend uh, will close out on uh, Sunday and uh, Friday and Saturday, a bunch of fun stuff uh, going on, but uh, let's not forget uh, Sunday. Uh, the fun will continue. Yes, um, nine o'clock. We're serving a breakfast: pancakes, sausage, applesauce. Um, at eleven thirty, there will be a polka mass that'll be inside the Inwood, uh, on the stage. Uh, the music will be provided by uh, the Jim Busta Band. So uh, after the mass is over, they'll have a little break, and then the Jim Busta Band will perform at one o'clock for your dancing uh, pleasure, and then at three o'clock. We have more dancing music. This will be the Ken Killian Orchestra. This is a 16-piece orchestra, the big band sound. I'm looking forward to that. I think that'll be awesome. And sounds like a, a great weekend and uh, really something to uh, celebrate this weekend because the uh, true ballrooms uh, around the area, there's really not uh, too many of them uh, remaining. And uh, the Inwood uh, has uh, withstood the test of time and... Uh, withstood the test of the Turkey River plenty of times too, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, speaking of that, I, I, wanted, I want people to know that the Inwood did not get flooded this time. Yes, there was high water, but it did not get inside the building. So um, if anybody is thinking that we got flooded again, you're wrong. So um, um, that was good news. Thank you, God. <laughs> yeah, def definitely uh, the case with uh, all the uh, celebrations that uh, you got going on this weekend. And really, it's, uh, you look at uh, anyone who has uh, spent a lot of time in uh, northeast Iowa, it's uh, hard to see, uh, hard to bump into anybody that wouldn't have uh, memories of going to the Inwood, whether it be for an event, uh, for the 4th of July uh, celebration, uh, for a wedding celebration. Uh, most people have uh, been there plenty of times and uh, have always had a great time when they're there, I'd imagine. Oh, yeah. It was definitely the place to be for many, many, many years. And um, I'd say hundreds of couples in northeast Iowa, you know, have met there probably had the wedding dance there and then their kids their grandkids same thing it's quite the tradition it it truly is and wanda and, uh, it's i'm sorry wanda i was just gonna say uh give us uh, one final uh who what where when and why one final uh invitation to uh, head to spillville uh, this weekend for three uh, fun-filled days of entertainment well, it will be uh, this weekend, it'll be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, September 17th, 18th, and 19th. Uh, Riverside Park in Spillville is where the Inwood is located. Um, there's a campground back there. There's playground equipment for the kids. It's just a beautiful area. Lots of parking, lots of sun space, lots of shade place. Just uh, a beautiful spot along the banks of the Turkey River. Um, I do want to mention one other thing. We will have some uh, uh, some nice silent auction items too. Uh, some of them quite unique. Uh, those will be on display through the weekend. So um, check those out as well. Anything we're missing? Anything else you want to pass on? Mm, just an interesting note that yes, there's very few ballrooms left anymore in the state, in the country. And this one has been in continuous operation, although it's seasonal but in continuous operation ever since it began. And it began very humbly as a way to raise money to build a memorial to uh, the, the soldiers and sailors who served in World War I. So this goes way, way back um, to the 1900s, obviously. Um, and um, it's been in continuous operation and you just don't see structures like this anymore. Um, it's fun to watch people walk into the Inwood who have never been there before and watch them look up, their mouths drop open, and you kind of hear them, well, you see them do a quiet wow. 
So it's it's a neat place. No doubt about it. And uh, Wanda, we appreciate you taking some time to tell us all about the fun uh, coming up uh, this weekend and uh, 100th anniversary for the Inwood Ballroom uh, coming up this weekend in Spillville. And uh, we look forward to uh, chatting with you for the 125th, the 150th, 175th. What do you say? <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> Let's go. Wanda Cole from the uh, Inwood Ballroom in Spillville. One Coming up this weekend is the Northeast Iowa Walk to End Alzheimer's in Decorah. It will take place on Saturday. And with us to discuss the event, the committee chair of the Walk in Decorah, Michaela Collins. And Michaela, tell us about the event uh, coming up uh, this Saturday. Uh, Obviously, with the way the world has been, uh, you've had to give people a few uh, different options to participate in this event. Uh, That was the case last year. And It's going to be the case again uh, this year, from what I understand. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. They will have the option to walk from home with a virtual piece that will connect them, much like they will be there in person. And there is an in-person option to join us at Decorah City Hall Saturday morning as well. And what is your uh, connection to uh, the Alzheimer's Association? Uh, How did you uh, get involved uh, with this group? I've been involved for uh, about 10 years. And I just see a future without Alzheimer's, hopefully sooner than later. And as for the folks that will be participating uh, with the walk beginning from City Hall on Saturday morning, uh, how do they get involved? How do they sign up? Uh, They can sign up online or they can join us Saturday morning and sign up right there with a contact list registration. And what will the uh, day all entail? Uh, What will the walk all entail for those that uh, will be uh, taking off from City Hall? Yep. Um, So the registration starts at 8. The um, program starts at 9. The walk will start right at 9.05. We're doing a shortened one due to COVID. Uh, Then they will take a walk through part of Decorah, downtown, and the trail. And then they will come back and there'll be some refreshments before and after as well well as some other opportunities for photos and sharing stories. And what is the goal uh, for the uh, walk uh, this year? Uh, What do you uh, hope to accomplish besides obviously the awareness of uh, Alzheimer's and uh, how it affects people? Yep, awareness and then raising money because that does help us with care, support and research efforts moving forward to help find an end to the Alzheimer's disease. And if folks want to get involved uh, with the donation, let's say they uh, have got other things uh, going on on Saturday and want to make a a donation to this worthy cause, how do they do that? They can uh, donate at alz.org or they could contact me myself and my phone number is 563-880-8030. Anything else uh, you want to pass on uh, to uh, the folks uh, this morning about this event uh, coming up on Saturday? I just hope they join us, and whether that be from home or in person. I know the temperatures are going to be sunny in uh, in the 80s, so uh, hydrate a little bit before you go on your walk on uh, Saturday morning, but uh, you're doing so for a great cause. And, uh, Michaela, we thank you for uh, taking a few moments to uh, talk about the uh, Northeast Iowa Walk for Alzheimer's uh, coming up this weekend. We wish best of luck with the event. Thank you. Michaela Collins is the committee chair for the Northeast Iowa Walk for Alzheimer's coming up this Saturday. The uh, registration begins at 8 a.m. at City Hall in Decorah, or you can walk from home and uh, get all the details online. Our thanks to our guest on the program this morning, South Winnesheek School District Superintendent Chris Eink, Decorah School Superintendent Mark Lane, Wanda Cole from the Inwood Ballroom in Spillville, the 100th anniversary taking place this weekend. And also uh, Michaela Collins from the Northeast Iowa Walk for Alzheimer's that is taking place uh, this Saturday in Decorah. Don't forget each and every week you can watch Our Town. We post uh, the video of Our Town usually on Wednesday afternoons and then we air the program Thursday mornings and If you can't uh, be with us on the radio on Thursday mornings, uh, you can watch Our Town and see the people uh, that we talk to on a week-in and week-out basis. Uh, Our Town available on our YouTube channels. Uh, If you're on YouTube, you can just search, uh, like today's date, 916 Our Town program. You'll find it. Uh, We'll also post it on our social media channels via Winnis Communications as well. 
That's going to do it for the show this morning. We thank our guest. We thank the Corps of Bank and Trust. And we most importantly thank you for tuning in, for logging on, or for watching our town on 94.9 and 99.1 The River.